Uh, my kind of segue from above ground activism to direct action took place um, after you know a certain period of time where you're standing outside. I'd been involved in activism for about a, you know we'll say about a year, and you know you stand outside a, a McDonald's and you flyer um, with you know why vegan you know pamphlets, and that's a great thing. I stand by that 100%. But there's a lot more that I was doing um, that I really started to question after a certain period of time. Um, particularly, you know, we'd go to like the pet store that bought dogs from the puppy mill and we would protest that place. We'd go to the first store and we'd stand outside, you know, with a sign. We'd go to the University of Washington. They had the health sciences building there. It was a huge uh, vivisection uh, apparatus. And uh, we'd make our little signs with pens that said, you know, please stop killing animals or what have you. And, you know, I began to reflect and I, I would look back on, you know, a year or more of my activism and I thought, you know, how many animals did I really, did I really save? Um, you know, we were very polite, uh, we were very um, well-intentioned, but ultimately, again, if, if you're going to be an advocate on behalf of animals, ultimately it's about what's best for the animals, and it's about what's effective. And um, I, had, I started to reflect and realize, you know, at the end of the day, how many animals did we really save? Um, and I realized, you know, sort of this formulaic uh, protest model uh, just was not getting the job done. Uh, how was it that you were first Well, that's it's a long story. I first, I got indicted in 1998 for a wave of uh, mink releases that happened across the Midwest in 1997. And what had happened is there had been a six week, uh, it was actually a two week period um, in uh, fall of 1997. And you had six mink releases across the Midwest. You had one in South Dakota, two in Iowa, and I th uh, two or three in Iowa, and four and three in Wisconsin, rather. Um, so you had six mink releases in a, in a two week period. Um, and shortly after the last mink release, myself and one other person, we were seen uh, surveying fur farms. We were seen passing a large fur farm, the uh, Zimble Mink Ranch in, uh, I think it was Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And the uh, Linda Zimble, one of the uh, owners of the fur farm, she got in her car. She followed us. She thought she, you know, we were acting suspicious. Uh, we had no idea at the time the FBI had put out this bulletin across um, the larger Midwest region. Um, alerting, you know, fur farmers as well as law enforcement to look out for a red Geo Metro, which is what we were driving. And apparently we'd been seen around fur farms and there was sort of people were starting to connect the dots, uh, fur farmers and the FBI. And so she gave chase. Uh, she called the police. The police pulled us over. They impounded our vehicle uh, when we refused to consent to a search. And um, they turned up a lot of things in that vehicle that was used as the basis for an indictment. They found bolt cutters. They found fur farm addresses. They found, you know, ski masks and the whole kind of laundry list of things that you might use uh, if you were going to raid a fur farm. So it certainly didn't take a whole lot of uh, investigative work or too many leaps of logic on their part to determine that we might have something to do with these raids. So um, that was used to indict us a year later. What do you think connecting you to any specific raid with evidence of you? Actually that came out later. What happened later is that they used um, uh, wi the wire cutters that they found in our vehicle. They sent that to the FBI crime lab in, uh, in uh, whatever D.C. it is. And um, they did what's called tool mark analysis, and they basically did a sort of this microscopic zoom in view of the, of the, uh, the bolt cutters. And they matched that, and the, the specific grooves on the bolt cutters, they matched that to the, some of the wire samples that were taken from these fur farms. And they found that I think on one or two of these uh, fur farms, there was a perfect match. So um, that was kind of used as a stepping stone to just indicting us for the whole package. What's the before after? That was, that was the Animal Enterprise Terrorism um, indictment. Um, yeah, that, that indictment was, I was in charge with two counts of Animal Enterprise Terrorism, uh, which sounds like a really crazy, you know, uh, scary charge. And at the time, it was actually only a misdemeanor. So you faced up to a year in prison for that. Um, now, of course, you would face up to 10 years in prison for what I faced um, a maximum of one year in prison for in 98. So it's a, kind of a different climate now, to say the least. But um, I was charged with two counts of animal enterprise terrorism and then four counts of disruption of interstate commerce through threat or violence. Uh, how were you eventually um, incarcerated for the charges? Mm, I don't like to tell that story. <laughs> I got arrested. I got arrested at a, at a Starbucks in uh, San Jose, California, and I was waiting for a friend of mine. I was going to meet her, and um, you know, it was just a freak, freak thing. A cop thought that I was acting somewhat suspicious. Maybe I didn't fit the profile for the typical Starbucks patron. But um, he came up and started asking me questions about what I was doing. And it was a big hangout spot. I learned later a big hangout spot for police in San Jose, this, this particular Starbucks. And asked me what I was doing. And I, you know, as I, you should always do with a cop, I refused to speak to him about anything. And he became very aggravated and placed me under arrest under what I 
you know, was actually just a totally false pretext. Um, and when they got me down to the station, uh, they scanned my fingerprints, and the warrants came up from '98. So that was seven years later. It was 2005.